time, the SA Voluntary Assisted Dying Bill, which has been jointly hosted today by Palliative Care South Australia and COTA SA. My name is Helen Walker and I am your moderator for this webinar. Firstly, I'd like to acknowledge the lands that you are meeting on in Adelaide are the lands of the Ghana people. Meanwhile, in Toowoomba, where I am this week, the traditional owners for the Darling Downs are the Jagera, Gaibal and Jarawa peoples. We pay our respects to their elders, past, present, present and emerging. We also recognise the cultural authority of all other Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples who walk, work and live on these places. I have been asked to facilitate this webinar today as I am the immediate past Deputy Chair of Palliative Care South Australia, the current Deputy Chair of Palliative Care Australia. And in my day job, I am the nurse unit manager of the Laurel Hospice at Flinders Medical Centre. In 2018, as part of a PCA delegation, I was privileged to go on a study tour overseas to explore voluntary assisted dying in Canada and the USA. The results of this study tour have resulted in guiding principles and the current position statement for palliative care and VAD held by PCA. Also in March 2020, I drew on this experience in the PCA presentation, the Joint Parliamentary Committee on End of Life Choices, chaired by the Honourable Kaya Ma. PCA holds two very clear positions in relation to voluntary assisted dying. Firstly, that access to effectively and equitably resourced palliative care services must be available for all South Australians in their location and to the level required to optimise symptom management and supportive care. VAD should never be the choice because palliative care to the level required is not accessible. This point was included in the End of Life Choices Report tabled in the SA Parliament on the 13th of October, 2020. Secondly, PCA knows that this topic, because of the deeply held views held by many and the changing community's perspective, remains vital for opportunities for robust informed discussion to occur in the public domain. Hence, we are here today to explore the draft VAD legislation in South Australia. I have much pleasure in welcome, welcoming the Honourable Kaya Ma, MLC, as a sponsor of that bill to the webinar. Kaya is the Shadow Attorney General, Shadow Minister for Aboriginal Affairs, and Shadow Minister for Industrial Relations and the Public Sector. Having chaired the Joint Parliamentary Committee, he tabled the draft legislation in the Legislative Council on December the 2nd, 2020 at the same time that Dr. Susan Close read it into the lower house. We have invited Kaim today to speak to the end of life choices report, the draft legislation and the process that it may take through both houses in the South Australian parliament. After Kaim has presented, there will be opportunity for some questions that have been sent in to us and we will respond to them as we can. You may also want to list questions from the audience on the Q and A function at the bottom of your screen. And if we have time, we'll get to some of those as well. Now I'd like to have Kaim take over from me and uh, invite you to speak to our audience now. Uh, thank you very much. Um, uh, as Helen introduced me, I'm Kaim Ma. I'm a member of the upper house of the South Australian parliament and chaired the End of Life Choices uh, Joint House Select Committee that the South Australian Parliament had running for 18 months or so. What I thought I'd do today is, is outline a few things. I might talk a bit about how we got to where we are in South Australia with the Bill Before Parliament, uh, uh, particularly that committee that uh, Helen referred to. Uh, have a, a bit of a chat about what's happening around Australia with voluntary assisted dying legislation implementation. Um, step through a, a little bit about how this bill works, um, what the elements are. Um, uh, and I might outline then a bit of my, my personal experience of, and why I am passionate about voluntary assisted dying and enacting in South Australia. And then I'll outline a little bit about you know, where we are in the parliamentary process and what the next steps will be in South Australia. Um, 
as as Helen outlined, and as this um, webinar is titled, this is the 17th attempt at legislation for voluntary assisted dying in the South Australian Parliament over the last uh, 25 years. Um, the late Dr. Bob Such, I think, is responsible for about a third of those attempts over his time in Parliament, and Mark Parnella Green's uh, MP is responsible for a large part of the other attempts. So. Uh, 16 previous times uh, voluntary assisted dying has been put before the parliament. Uh, on each of those you know, attempts at legislation, it would have had South Australia as the first jurisdiction, um, well, first state in Australia after you know, the NT some time ago for a very short period had a voluntary assisted dying scheme. Um, but now, as, I, as I'll talk about later, we, we, we won't be the first. There are other jurisdictions that have uh, passed legislation. And I think that will make a difference to how that flows uh, um, in terms of the debate and, and MP support in South Australia. Uh, so in the lead up to legislation being introduced, there was about 18 months of a joint house select committee. So members from the upper house of state parliament where, where I reside, as well as members from the lower house, uh, took evidence, uh, written and oral submissions, um, uh, ventured to Melbourne to have a look at the scheme that was uh, uh, just about to be implemented at the time uh, uh, we were uh, started our hearings and been implemented. We finished uh, uh, about end of life choices. Predominantly, it was about voluntary assisted dying uh, legislation, in other jurisdictions with a particular focus on Victoria, but it also looked at issues including um, uh, palliative care and advanced care directions. Uh, and had made some recommendations, but with advanced care directions in the, um, the desirability for uniform and transferable uh, advanced care directions across Australia, and also the need for uh, increased funding for palliative care within South Australia. Uh, we had in excess of 100 uh, written submissions and dozens of witnesses who uh, presented to the Committee on End of Life Choices, um, ranging from yeah, individuals uh, who practice in the uh, uh, area of palliative care or deal with um, uh, specific uh, specialties such as cancer treatment uh, where, where people might access voluntary assisted dying. We heard from um, uh, individuals who had experience with uh, people who have died who would have otherwise liked to access uh, voluntary assisted dying. We heard from many different organisations representing different groups, including um, medical professionals, uh, other healthcare professionals and religious organisations. Um, I think the most compelling evidence that we heard on that committee was a written submission from the South Australian Police, as well as um, uh, the, co the coroner's office giving oral submissions to that committee. Um, they were very consistent in terms of the police submission and the coroner's submission where they estimated about one in 10 suicides the police attend to or the, the coroner gets referred to the, uh, to the coroner are people with a terminal illness taking matters into their own hands. Um, as the police noted in their submission that uh, many deaths in those circumstances are undignified, violent and often committed in isolation, which on occasion results in the death not becoming known to others for some time. Uh, and that there's also a degree of pain suffered depending on the method and level of expertise on the person taking their own life. And I, I think for, for many of us on that committee, that was what yeah, one of the most influential submissions that, uh, that was made to the committee that, uh, that regardless or not, regardless of whether or not there is a legislated scheme for voluntary assisted dying, you know, one in 10 suicides in South Australia, it's made be you know, people who may otherwise yeah, uh, find a better, more peaceful way. And, and I won't go into the details because there was similar evidence presented to the Victorian Select Committee before their bill. But yeah, family members and frontline responders like police and uh, ambulance officers who have to deal with um, yeah, the, the often grisly and difficult suicides that occur because that's not a legal pathway for someone looking to end that suffering in the final stage of the terminal illness. Um, yeah, I, I think had, had a pretty good effect on many of us on the committee and, and also those who've uh, read the committee report. Um, the committee spent uh, a, a few days in Melbourne uh, 
uh, with health officials and members of the Voluntary Assisted Dying Review Board in Melbourne about the Victorian scheme, uh, having a look at the, the protections that were in place in Victoria, Victoria and how they work, which was exceptionally beneficial for us considering what we would do in South Australia. Um, the, the committee uh, reported and, uh, and was a useful guide in terms of different jurisdictions, but it, it focused particularly on the Victorian legislation. Uh, and that's uh, yeah, what, what was very influential in what's the legislation that's before the South Australian Parliament. In terms of around Australia, Victoria 18 months ago uh, commenced their voluntary assisted dying scheme. There's been six monthly reports uh, by the Voluntary Assisted Dying Review Board into the operations of their scheme. Um, of, of all of the, uh, the people who have availed themselves to voluntary assisted dying in Victoria, I think there's been one case where the paperwork wasn't properly filled in with a minor clerical error, but beside that, besides that, it's been reported as 100% compliance with the scheme. Um, the, the inter one of the more interesting things from the Victorian scheme has been the conclusions drawn about some of the concerns people have about voluntary assisted dying. One of the concerns that's often raised is that uh, there will be coercion or you know, people will feel uh, obliged to um, uh, partake in the scheme. The, the most common way that's expressed is uh, concerns you know, um, kids of an elderly person who is, who is sick with a terminal illness may put pressure on them because they want to you know, stand to gain inheritance. Um, the, the, the Victorian uh, chair of the review board is... Um, I said a couple of times that she's looked for evidence of that very, very hard and can't find any at all. In fact, in the, the latest report, it's reported that it is, if anything, it goes in the opposite way, that children of uh, people with a terminal illness who are thinking about voluntary assisted dying try to convince their, yeah, yeah, their, their parent out of uh, availing themselves to it rather than you know, coercion the other way. But as has been reported in the Victorian reports, um, yeah, after the, yeah, discussions with their, their medical practitioners and with their parents, most most children in that situation uh, come around to understand the parents' wish to use the scheme. So it's been really useful having the Victorian scheme up and running uh, yeah, for some time now to, to sort of uh, allay some of the concerns that legislators have about how the scheme might be used and and those concerns are there yeah, might be yeah, coercion or used inappropriately. Um, since Victoria's started the scheme, we've seen the uh, Western Australian Parliament um, legislate for voluntary assisted dying, and they're in their implementation phase with their, their um, health department now setting up what's required for that scheme to become operational. And uh, uh, just recently, in the last few days, we've seen the Tasmanian Parliament um, uh, both houses now pass their scheme. I know that uh, in the last year in the upper house of the Tasmanian Parliament, it was a 15 mil vote in favour, so a unanimous vote in favour, which is quite unusual uh, in my experience in politics, and then passed the lower house and, and finally um, uh, passed all stages of Parliament just in the last couple of days. So what that means is where once in any of the last 16 attempts, South Australia would have been the first jurisdiction uh, to pass legislation to enable voluntary assisted dying. If it passes this time, we will become the fourth. We'll be middle of the field and not uh, out the front. And, I, and again, I know that there are a number of members of parliament who that gives you know, some relief to, that, uh, that you know, we're not being the first. You know, although there are schemes in other places around the world, we have seen it now operating in the Australian context. And... Uh, and uh, yeah, there are, I know, a, 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 a couple of MPs who voted against the last attempt in South Australia, but have yeah, publicly uh, stated and have been reported in the media as they will vote for a Victorian model because that, yeah, that, they've got some assurity that yeah, it, it works and it's not, uh, it's not being abused and that some of the concerns that have been raised haven't played out uh, in Victoria. So that, that takes us on to the bill we currently have before the South Australian Parliament. As Helen said, uh, I introduced it in the Upper House and my colleague, the member for Port Adelaide, Dr Susan Close, introduced it in the Lower House on December 2nd, 
last year. Um, this bill is effectively a copy of the Victorian bill. You know, there, there are minor changes because it needs to refer to different pieces of South Australian legislation, but it is, um, uh, uh, for all intents and purposes, a copy of, of the uh, Victorian bill. And, and again, that's quite deliberate. As I said, yeah, there are a number of members of parliament in South Australia who publicly stated that you know, they, they are comfortable voting for the Victorian model when in the past they haven't been comfortable voting for you know, a model that they didn't know how it would work. Um, I might note too that the, the last attempt in, of voluntary assist dying in South Australia was a tied vote in the lower house, 23 votes for, 23 votes against and failed on the casting vote of the Speaker of the, uh, the lower house. So yeah, it is an area that uh, yeah, has been, yeah, it get, it's getting closer and closer and with, as I said, three other jurisdictions passing legislation. I think most people regard it not as a matter of if voluntary assisted dying will become legislated in South Australia, but when it becomes legislated. And, uh, and again, I know there are MPs who are you know, sort of in the middle or sitting on the fence who are, you know, what, one of the things that, that um, some are being persuaded by is the fact that you know, we have a, a Victorian model that I'll get to in a moment is a very a very conservative and protective model. And Dan Andrews, the Premier of Victoria, um, refers to it as the most uh, conservative voluntary assisted dying scheme uh, in operation. Uh, and it, it has similarities with the Western Australian, the Tasmanian model. Uh, yeah, many of the elements are, are very similar between uh, what the states have done. And I, I think that's a reasonably good thing. If yeah, the, In an ideal world, this would be legislation that is yeah, uh, identical in all states so that yeah, people who move from state to state as people do or medical practitioners that move from state to state you know, have that consistency but you know, there are a number of essential elements that are very very similar and Stephen Wade the South Australian Health Minister spoke last uh, the last week in South Australian Parliament referring to the Australian model because you know, there are some of the characteristics that are very similar between all of them. I might just go through with this bill that you know, the those essential elements of, of the bill and uh, the criteria for voluntary assisted dying. So it, it, it's in section 13 of the legislation in South Australia. It sets out the criteria for someone to be eligible for voluntary assisted dying in South Australia. And again, yeah, this is identical to the requirements in Victoria. Um, the person uh, to be eligible for access to voluntary assisted dying must be at 18 years older, 18 years of age or more. Uh, the person must be an Australian citizen or permanent resident, an ordinary resident in South Australia, and at the time of first making the request to being a resident in South Australia for at least 12 months, uh, they must have decision-making capacity in relation to voluntary assisted dying. And again, like Victoria, it's, it legislatively goes through what's required for uh, that, uh, that decision-making capacity. And the person must be diagnosed with a disease, illness or medical condition that's firstly incurable, is advanced, progressive and will cause death and is expected to cause death within uh, weeks or months, but not exceeding six months, uh, except for a, neuro, a neurodegenerative disease, which can be 12 months. And finally, that uh, it's causing suffering to that person that cannot be relieved in a manner that person considers tolerable. So they are the criteria that have to be made out for a person to be able to access a voluntary assisted dying scheme. And then it talks about the legislation goes through the process for accessing voluntary assisted dying. Um, a person has to make a first request. Uh, and it, it's very clear that it's the, the person who wants to use the scheme that has to make a request. In fact, the, the Act uh, creates an offence for a medical practitioner to be the one to suggest the uh, yeah, voluntary assisted dying to a person. So it, it has to be the person who wants to uh, use the scheme has to be the one to make the request. It can't be uh, yeah, a suggestion or an option put forward by a medical practitioner. So a person wanting to use the scheme makes that first request. Uh, the person then has to be assessed by a, a medical practitioner as being eligible for the voluntary assisted dying scheme, going through that criteria that I talked about just before. Um, and any doctor can 
yeah, refuse to uh, be involved in in voluntary assist dying. If a doctor does not wish to um, help a patient with voluntary assist dying, has, is, has a conscientious objection, they uh, they in no way uh, have to uh, uh, participate in in the scheme whatsoever. Section nine of the Act yeah, specifically caters for that. That uh, you know, no one has to provide information, participate in any request, um, or or help a patient with the voluntary assisted dying process. So if, if a doctor um, is prepared to uh, help their patient through voluntary assisted dying, and they have also completed the required training that the health department will put in place as they have in Victoria, then that first doctor becomes the coordinating mm -hmm. medical practitioner for that person. Um, and that, that person, as I said, the coordinating medical practitioner needs to satisfy themselves that all of the eligibility criteria have been met out. Um, the, the, the patient then has to uh, see a second medical practitioner, effectively a second opinion, and that second medical practitioner um, also has to um, uh, turn their mind to and satisfy themselves that the criteria are made out for the person. Um, then the person has to make a, a final request to their coordinating, their first doctor, and that final request has to be at least nine days after the initial request. So it, it gives that time period for people to properly consider their decision and if that's what they are, are sure that they want for themselves, unless the doctor considers that the, the person may die before that final request. Um, uh, the person then, uh, the person makes a written declaration as to their wishes for voluntary assisted dying. A contact person is appointed uh, for the, for the uh, patient who wishes to access voluntary assisted dying. Uh, and then a, the coordinating medical practitioner replies for a voluntary assisted dying permit. Uh, and at any stage during all of you know, these hoops and hurdles that have to be um, gone through, you know, the, the patient can at any stage decide they don't wish to participate anymore and, and don't wish to uh, continue with their application of voluntary assisted dying. It is completely up to the patient in this stage to, to decide, no, I don't want to do this. Um, and what, what has been uh, found, not just in Victoria, but around the world, is that there are quite a large percentage in, in some jurisdictions in excess of half, in some others even more, of people who have applied for a voluntary assisted dying permit, been granted um, um, the ability to use a voluntary assisted dying scheme, but then don't go through with uh, you know, taking the substance that ends their life. And, and we certainly heard that on the committee that uh, the, the fact that you know, someone who's in a lot of pain at the end of a terminal illness knows that this is an option, that they've been approved to, uh, to take the substance if they wish, provides a great deal of peace of mind uh, comfort and helps with uh, mental health at, at that really difficult time at the end of life. So yeah, at any stage, a, a patient can not follow through with their request. And at any stage also, yeah, uh, a patient doesn't have to, even if uh, they've been approved, as, as many don't actually follow through, but yeah, certainly it, it, there is a lot of evidence that it, it gives peace of mind and that yeah, a, uh, an a an ability that they've got more control over their own life towards the end, just having been approved for the scheme. Um, I might just like the this is something that I've always had a view ought to be allowed for people you know, under prescribed circumstances as it is with this bill. That um, yeah, it's an essential element to, to have that control over the end of your life if you're in a great deal of pain, uh, but it was my personal experience about three and a half years ago with my mum that uh, solidified my uh, uh, my resolve and, and has, uh, yeah, has provided some of the driving impetus between yeah, me chairing the committee and introducing the bill. Uh, my mum was diagnosed with pancreatic cancer and uh, died about six months after diagnosis, which uh, from my experience with the guy who gave me my first job in politics, a former Aboriginal Affairs Minister who had the same uh, Conditions, yeah, you know, since uh, yeah, about you know, the, the time frame often with pancreatic cancer, but it was in, in my mum's towards the very end, like a couple of weeks before she died, 
she got myself, my two brothers, and and her husband, my dad, in the room with her doctor, and, and just said, "Look, this to Ashford Hospital. This is just too painful. I I, I can't take this anymore. I, I don't want to go on." And and of course, there isn't a le- a legal option for um, to make that happen you know, in, in an easy and painless way in South Australia. Um, so, like happens, and I've heard many many stories similar to this uh, over the last few years. Uh, my mum yeah, decided she wanted to refuse all medical treatment and interventions after that, and the doctors you know, gave her overnight to think about that, and she restated her very uh, clear wish the next morning. And for, for almost two weeks, yeah, essentially you know, starved and wasted away in, in often immense pain in the times that you know, she woke up and was lucid again. Um, yeah, we won't know exactly yeah, how much pain she was in for a lot of the time, but certainly in, in those times where she you know, head bolted up, you know, shout, you know, almost shout out, am I dead yet? I can't take this. It did. You can only imagine in a body that's wasting away the sort of pain that an, an individual goes through. So that after that, uh, that sort of uh, still my resolve and uh, determination that this should be an option for people in those and so many other situations where there is intolerable pain at the very end of a terminal illness. Uh, so as I said, that led to the, the committee in South Australia being established, the bill that's currently before Parliament. Um, it, it was introduced on December 2nd uh, in both houses of Parliament, sort of over the, the parliamentary Christmas break, there was discussion about which chamber of Parliament it would progress through first. And for a whole number of reasons, you know, uh, you know, uh, primary amongst them, the workload of the different chambers and where you know, there was enough time to start the debate, it started in my chamber of the Legislative Council. So uh, last sitting week, uh, we started second reading debates, which is you know, each of the um, 21 members of the Legislative Council getting, you know, just having their say about what they think of the issue and what they think of the legislation. Uh, next Wednesday, uh, the 31st of March, those second reading contributions will um, will finish up and there'll be a second reading vote, which is the first hurdle for legislation. Uh, that second reading vote, if that's successful, then put, uh, takes the bill into the committee stage. And uh, and that will, if, if the second reading vote is passed, which often people will vote for the second reading, even if they're not going to vote for the you know, legislation in the end, to allow that debate to, to continue. Uh, so yeah, there is, I think, a, a good prospect of the second reading vote on the 31st of March will be successful. And then uh, on that day, and then concluding again on the next Wednesday that the upper house sits, which will be the 5th of May, um, the if, if that second reading vote is successful, there'll be the committee stage of the uh, legislation. And then what that entails is yeah, the, the and I'm just looking at the, the act, the all um, uh, 110, 115 yeah, different sections of the bill and the schedule of the bill will be gone through individually and each of those um, sections of the bill will be individually debated and voted on and amendments moved. So that's yeah, it's the sort of guts of the debate uh, at that committee stage where um, yeah, you really scrutinise exactly what each section, each clause of the uh, the legislation uh, does and will do. Then uh, on the the fifth of May, if if that is successful in the legislative council, and I, as it has been in the past, I would expect that I would expect that will, will be a uh, a reasonably close vote. Um, but if that's successful, then the legislation goes to the House of Assembly, the the lower house of state parliament. And uh, there are, I think, three sitting weeks before the state budget in mid-June. And uh, I, th- I think most people's expectations are that if it makes it to the, if it passes the upper house, goes to the lower house, uh, it'll be debated and resolved one way or another in those sitting weeks uh, before uh, mid-June. So, uh, yeah, I, I would expect a resolution one way or the other to the bill, this, the 17th attempt for voluntary assistance in South Australia to occur uh, by uh, mid-June this year. And then yeah, if, if, if that is successful, uh, uh, we'd expect then 
as has happened in other states, you know, some time, and, and I think the implementation phase in Victoria was about 18 months. Um, as other states implement, I, I expect that my, my guess is it won't take as long because there will be lessons learned from the implementation in Victoria from uh, the implementation that's happening in uh, Western Australia already. So you know, you'd logically expect it probably wouldn't be 18 months like Victoria being the first, but yeah, it'll be sometime and it is, it is important to get these things uh, right, given the concerns people have about possible um, misuse of the scheme. So uh, after if it passes in mid-June, yeah, it, it might be 12 months, say, so possibly um, of implementation before the scheme's up and running. So that, that's sort of an outline of you know, why I'm passionate about this, how we got to where we are now, what the legislation is and it does, and, and how it's probably going to progress uh, through Parliament. But again, at any of those stages of that second reading vote, the vote on the bill, and then in the lower house, it's the same process, the second reading vote, vote on the bill. So yet there are those four different voting stages. If any of those are unsuccessful, then, uh, then the bill uh, fails. And uh, uh, I expect there'll be an 18th attempt at some stage uh, after the uh, state election, which is due in 12 months' time. But as I say, uh, I'm, I'm quite certain it's not a question of this, if this gets legislated in South Australia, but when. The end. Thank you, Kaim, and uh, that was um, a really clear uh, walk through the processes to date. And having um, presented myself to the committee, I can uh, assure people that there was a lot of interest in what uh, people had to say and, and some really good questioning. Um, we have questions for you uh, that have been bobbing up as you've been speaking. First one comes from Doris Henderson who highlighted the film Fade to Black, which tells Peter's short story. She asked, how can people be made uh, more aware of the desperate need for common sense with regard to voluntary euthanasia through films such as Fade to Black? Yeah, thanks for the question. I saw the film Fade to Black uh, not long after it came out. And I, I think it was, I saw it in the Lunga Cinema um, the week after my mum's funeral, and so it was a little bit raw at the time, but it, it, it's a really important film talking about you know, one person's desire to access voluntary euthanasia um, and, and, and looking at ways to do it you know, as, as people do illegally. You know, as the, the police and coroner said, some people commit suicide in gruesome ways. We do know that other people look to the black market for drugs to end their own life. And, and this followed um, uh, someone looking that path who, who if I'm remembering correctly, um, procured um, a substance to do that, but like so many in the end, decided not to. And it, it is, uh, yeah, it, it's not surprising that, 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 that desire to cling to whatever life there is, no matter what quality, it's just such a, a strong thing to do. So this was, you know, uh, if I'm remembering the film, one of those cases where someone you know, had the substances you know, that, that could have ended their life but elected not to take them. Um, there, there's another uh, um, uh, story of a family that I became aware of when I introduced the bill. I've, I've you know, talked and, and shed tears with many families who have got uh, stories about you know, their loved ones and voluntary sister dying. A similar one, uh, the owner of the uh, bakery in Woodner had a son who uh, I think the Ewing sarcoma, a, a, a pretty nasty form of cancer, and the son uh, had you know, done his own research, had decided to procure drugs that had ended his life, and his parents, you know, every time they went out, weren't sure whether they'd come back and find their son still alive or not. And in the end, the son, you know, following what he'd read on the internet, yeah, videotaped when he just you know, the whole thing when he decided to take the substances so that it was clear that it was him doing it. Um, they didn't work quickly or painlessly, and uh, a police investigation uh, took place afterwards, and it, it really traumatized the family. So, yeah, the as Fade to Black, the documentary looks at, and as uh, yeah, the, the family in Woodner's experience is with, with people taking matters in their own hands, it, it is really, really difficult. and. Uh, and I think, yeah, 
I think say to blacks probably are available on the internet and it, it is it is really important that uh, you know, regardless of your view that uh, you know, people can they they avail themselves to films like these just to have an understanding of you know, of, yeah that first that first hand understanding of you know, being someone's shoes who's looking to do this mm. and I think that issue of safety is something that um, features very strongly in the PCA guiding principles. So it's certainly something that we picked up on our international travels was it's just not about taking a potion, it's about it being a safe a thing to do. And I know safety with a, uh, when you're talking about end of life, but you know, to get this wrong is, uh, is difficult. So that's why the legislation is very important. So I've got another question. This is from Keith Usher. Um, it's pre at present, it is legal in South Australia for a doctor to end a patient's suffering using palliative sedation, by which means the patient would die slowly and painlessly over a period of time, possibly even a week or more. In absence of any alternative, this is very humane practice, but it is often hard on family members. I'm not aware of any local data, but based on the UK study, it is likely that there are 1,500 deaths in South Australia a year. The use of BAD would provide exactly the same result, but with a quick painless death at the sufferer's request. But the option of BAD cannot be used because it's illegal. Can you please comment on Keith's statement? And do you see the current draft voluntary assisted dying bill will correct this anomaly? Ah, uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. It will correct this anomaly. Certainly, some of the evidence that that uh, the that, that committee that I chaired took was uh, from medical uh, practitioners. We talked about the fact that under the Consent to Medical Treatment Act in South Australia, um, you can administer doses of you know, of morphine or, or other medications that that have the effect of causing death, but not as its primary function. So, if you if you're giving doses of, for example, as a as a doctor, morphine to relieve distress and to make someone comfortable um, uh, and that's its primary purpose the fact that uh, they're in doses large enough that it causes someone death is is legal and permissible in south australia as it is i think in all other states uh, but yeah, sometimes that that can blur the lines and is difficult for uh, medical professionals and certainly evidence we took was that uh, having a, yeah, a legislated voluntary assisted dying scheme removes that sort of grey area where yeah, it, is, it can be very deep. Someone expresses, I can't take this pain. Yeah, I'm, I'm, yeah, this is a terminal yeah, cancer I'm suffering and I want to die. Yeah, it, it, and and, a, and uh, that person is prescribed a uh, pain relief such that it gives them uh, comfort, but it also causes their death. Yeah, it, having a voluntary assistance scheme removes that sort of grey area where Medical practitioners can feel uneasy, or um, or uncertain about. Yeah, you know, could it be construed that they're they're giving into the patient's request to hasten their death, even if that's a secondary effect? Yeah, having a scheme here, I think it, it is not just good for those who who wish to avail themselves, uh, but it also provides that protection for medical practitioners in those areas. Uh, yeah, where, where yeah, there are doses that, as a secondary effect, do cause someone's death. Okay, so a bit more about, thank you for that. Um, a bit more about Bay to Black. There's been a request for the URLs to be put back, which should be good for our technical people to do that for us. Um, now, what else can I see here? What about the PCSA position of um, proper resourcing for palliative care in South Australia, Kaya? I completely agree. Palliative care is an important area of practice um, and it needs it, it needs better funding. There's been some small increases. There's been a lot more promise we haven't seen flow down yet. But in it is interesting, in every, in every jurisdiction that uh, voluntary assisted dying has, uh, has been legislated for, we've seen a commensurate increase in funding for palliative care. So, yeah, and that was certainly... The evidence of the committee took that palliative care is an exceptionally important area, mm. and yeah, voluntary assisted dying and palliative care are two different things. Mm. Yeah, one 
Voluntary don't is not an extension of palliative care. They are two very distinct, different things that, and, and, and ought not be confused because yeah, they are different things. And palliative care does require a more and better funding. And certainly we've, that's what we've seen in, uh, in Victoria and WA. Yeah, it's, it's voluntary assisted die should never be seen as first choice if there's not access to palliative care. Um, that is for sure. Um, so um, Mark Waters asked a question. There are a number of participants today who work in or represent aged care services in South Australia. What are the potential implications for aged care providers if this bill were to pass? Yeah, that, that, that is a good question. And I, I, I had a look this morning, I couldn't find it, but the, um, one of the reports from the Victorian scheme uh, showed that yeah, overwhelmingly it is people in their own home who uh, who elect to take the substance mm -hmm. in, yeah, in an aged care or residential care or other medical or a medical facility are, 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 are actually a very minor part of those who uh, participate in voluntary assisted dying. But certainly in Victoria, as, as they implemented their scheme, there were a number of publications and a lot of educational material for, for those who provide services to older people about how the scheme works and what it means for them. And, I would expect that to be the same in South Australia. If this legislation passes, I think it'll be an essential element of you know, the, the health department's preparation uh, to, to talk to and provide um, some explanations to things like aged care facilities, residential care facilities uh, and hospitals. Um, thank you for that. Yes, because the one of the big issues, of course, is... Um, can you all hear me there? Yep. One of the big issues, of course, is... Um, uh, the issue of um, um, capacity to make a decision and um, the pe people with dementia, what are your views there? Uh, the, the, the legislation spells it out very, very clearly. An individual has to understand yeah, the, effectively the nature and effect of the request that they're making. Um, a medical practitioner can't um, allow a person to qualify for the scheme if, if they don't have the capacity to understand uh, what it is they're doing in the scheme. And, and uh, yet yeah, it, it is legislated for, and uh, yeah, pretty prescriptively in, in terms of having to have capacity. And I think that's quite a reasonable thing. And, I, and, and you, you can't effectively have a, a, yeah, an, an advanced, almost like you, you can't have a, a, yeah, an advanced care directive in effect for voluntary assisted dying time you want to avail yourself to in those last six months, you have to have the capacity to ask for it. Um, yeah, there has been some some put up arguments that you, you ought to be able to you know, have preconditions where you know, a request kicks in if certain things happen. But yeah, this that the scheme Victoria and what's been proposed in South Australia requires a person at the time of making a request to have the capacity to do so. And did the committee hear anything um, from um, anybody about dementia and about what the future might hold? Um, I'd have to go back. I can't remember I, yep, specifically about dementia, but um, certainly that yeah, there were people who talked about uh, the fact that yeah, having yeah, having other conditions besides the one that um, uh, you're suffering the terminal illness from. So yeah, you, you might have yeah that, that the terminal cancer that's expected to bring about. Of death within six months, but you might also have other you know, other other conditions, whether you know, whether mental health or uh, um, you know, uh, people living with a disability. That and but that doesn't rule you out from the scheme as long as you have the mental capacity. Yeah, you're you're you're, you're able to and avail yourself to voluntary yeah. assistance. One of the interesting um, uh, elements of conversation we had with some providers of uh, medical assistance in dying in Canada, for example, was that in actual fact, palliative care service provision sitting alongside that scheme actually enabled um, capacity in several instances. So I think that notion that VAD and palliative care are separate is, is very true, but they can sit alongside of each other very well. Now, Dr. Peter Gregory supports the principle that competent individuals should have the right to determine their own future and to act freely. If that act causes no reasonable injury to others. He asserts the problem with the Victorian model 
is that it does not provide sufficient protections. It is not a question of morals, but of insufficient legal capacity due to conflicts of interest and lack of expertise to make the necessary decisions and determine the necessary actions. Coercion, competence and death to be determined and executed by two doctors who enter into a contract to perform an act for payment with a person seeking assisted suicide provides insufficient protection and oversight. Considering their expertise is in saving lives, these doctors are unqualified as well as ethically strained. My suggested method requires the establishment of a new profession of clinical assistant in supervising, funding and administering the system. How do you think the Draft Voluntary Assisted Dying Bill can address these concerns? Um, I think uh, for the question, I, I don't agree with the, I don't agree with the premise in the question. Uh, however, I'm afraid I I, I take a, a different view. I, I think that doctors are qualified to participate in the scheme. In, in my experience, uh, you know, doctors take their uh, you know, their duties and take their ethical requirements exceptionally seriously. Yeah, you know, uh, you know, doctors are. Uh, uh, yeah, are uh, highly, highly trained and high, yeah, in, in my experience, highly uh, ethical practitioners. Um, and, and the concerns that, that was raised in that question about areas like coercion, I think uh, the bill protects very, very strongly against. There are some 68 different protections and hurdles that are contained in the Victorian legislation that are in the South Australian legislation. And I think, as I talked about earlier, um, the evidence from Victoria shows that some of those concerns just haven't been borne out. Um, I, Betty King is a former Supreme Court uh, judge in Victoria. She's the chair of the Voluntary Assisted Dying Review Board. And I remember a quote from her after the first report of the scheme, the first six months of operation, where she uh, talked about coercion. She was quoting the media saying, I think that I found no evidence of, of this and trust me, I've looked very, very hard. And having met Betty King during the committee stage, um, I'm pretty sure if she was looking for something uh, and it was there, she would have found it. So um, I, I appreciate the, uh, the the views that's been put forward in the question, but I, I, that, they just haven't been borne out in Victoria. And I've got to say, I I, I may have more faith in medical practitioners than the, the person who's asking the question does. Yes, I think um, I think that um, I know the palliative care community would very much like to see that um, our referral to palliative care for a conversation uh, with palliative care consultant might be really useful uh, to talk through really clearly goals of care and really, I mean, it is a, a specialist area of care. And I think the um, conversation with the palliative consultant would be really useful in um, identifying some of the issues that might be served elsewhere. But um, I think the legislation will probably help with that. Um, is there anything else, Kaim, that you could give us some commentary on about what you picked up in Victoria? Well, for example, were there any concerns, anything that you think we can improve on? Yeah, look, uh, there, yeah, there are people who, you know, their, their views, their backgrounds, you know, their life experience, their religious beliefs, uh, yeah, Tick them one way or another, and uh, yeah, I think from Victoria, we, we heard both sides. We heard like you know, some of the um, views put forward in that last question that you know, that it might be too easy to uh, access voluntary assisted dying. Um, but we, when we took evidence in Victoria, we probably heard more the other way from those practitioners who had undertaken the mandatory training who were involved. Um, yeah, there were some complaints about the. The, the, the rigors and the hurdles in Victoria made it exceptionally difficult to access. You know, that there were you know, uh, numerous instances instances of you know, people at the end stage of terminal illness who'd applied but had passed away uh, before their application process was finalised. And, and, and getting that balance right is a really tricky part. And I think um, yeah, Victoria have erred on the side of, of caution, of, uh, of of deliberately making the scheme conservative with a, you know, a lot of uh, barriers to get through. Uh, you know, uh, and I think yeah, that, that it's a, one of the factors is that yeah, they were the first in Australia that deliberately set up that way. But I, I think yeah, 
that is a, a pretty good model that other jurisdictions around Australia, like South Australia, like Western Australia, like Tasmania, um, and like Queensland's about to start, is oh, yeah. to, well, in New South Wales about to have a bill. I think that, we, that, that Australian uh, model of voluntary assisted dying has erred on the side of caution, which I, I think is an unreasonable thing to do. Mm. So, look, we have a couple of more questions. One is about how the houses are stacking out in Parliament. You've, you've, bri you've briefly told us that, but are you a betting man? <laughs> um, not a lot. Uh, look, I, it, it will be close. My, there are 21 votes on the floor of my chamber, the Legislative Council, so 11 is a majority to, um, to pass anything. Look, my guess is uh, yeah, one way or another, yeah, the, the, whether it's a yes or a no, there will be somewhere between 11 and uh, 13 votes for the yes or the no. I think it'll be within, my guess is, within, um, within a, a vote or two of passing or failing. Um, in the lower house, I, I, I suspect it, it probably has, uh, my, my guess is that it, there is a, a, maybe even a better chance in the lower house that yeah, there are a number of people, and, and the, I'll give the example of Troy Bell, the independent member for Mount Gambia, uh, voted against the bill last time, was one of the, the 23 no's that tied with the 23 yeses. Um, yeah, I've had a number of conversations myself with Troy and he's um, yeah, quoted in his local uh, paper, the Board of Watch in Mount Gambia, as uh, this time, if it's a Victorian model, he will vote for it. So I, I think yeah, there are probably a couple in the, the lower house who may have been no's last time or there's been a bit of a change of personnel. You have people who have voted no who are no longer in Parliament after you know, the election in 2018 who have been replaced by people who are, are more predisposed. So uh, I don't know, but you know, my, my, my guess is if it passes the upper house, it may even find an easier passage through the lower house. But you know, I, I, I wouldn't like to bet on it even if I was a regular betting person, Alan. Okay. Uh, look, I better just throw in one more comment, which has come back from Doris, read the film. Uh, Peter's decision not to take the drug for relief of his pain was a result of his passion for people to see his journey to the very end, his last breath. Important fact that you need to know, a big ask of his wife and son and friend producing the film, Doris. So I think we can agree with that. Um, Kaim, I'm gonna hand back now to Jane Maseret. Um, it's been a pleasure moderating this session with you and um, uh, may there be more. So thank you very much and over to Jane. Thank you very much, Helen. Um, I'm uh, the Chief Executive of Code RSA um, and I, I wanted to uh, just outline why it is very important that uh, this webinar, this partnership with Palliative Care South Australia took place. Um, in 2019, we undertook across the Code of Federation the first ever comprehensive survey of older Australians about what they thought on a whole range of topics. The most outstanding, the most unequivocal uh, piece of uh, feedback that that survey gave us was that there is overwhelming support for voluntary assisted dying, 84% in fact. There was no other stat in that survey that gave that level of support. Um, importantly too, uh, as we dive down on those statistics, there wasn't variation across the states. And while there was a, a bit of uh, variation across age groups and religious backgrounds, for example, it, it, there was an overwhelming majority in each subgroup. This is something that older people are very much uh, uh, wanting to see on our statute books. Um, and so that makes it pretty compelling, I think, as this uh, comes up for the 17th time, as we've seen in Victoria and WA and now in Tasmania, um, that we see this through. Um, we share the palliative care uh, point of view, the palliative care uh, South Australia point of view, that this is, this is not either or with a decent, uh, equitable, high quality palliative care being available for all South Australians. Um, Kimes Committee, the End of Life Choices Committee, was also unequivocal in that being a very uh, big imperative. Um, we know that the state government is actively looking at improvements in palliative care and increased funding in palliative care. So um, we would support that. But this uh, legislation, importantly, um, underlines what I think the theme from older people is, 
uh, choice and control throughout people's lives is paramount. And uh, that is at, at the point of death as much as it is um, at the point of receiving aged care at any other stage. I just want to finish by uh, thanking the, uh, the 17 sponsors of the bill, including CHIME, um, and particularly the incredibly collaborative way that you're working, CHIME, um, across parties um, and, you know, with people like us. Uh, to explain carefully, you've certainly uh, presented to our policy council to explain carefully what this is about. So thank you very much. Thank you to Helen uh, for the moderation today. Um, and particularly, I want to recognise Mark Waters at the Palliative Care South Australia uh, and the team here. Um, they have brought this to you and, uh, and arranged the, the technical uh, capabilities. So I thank them very much. This is, it is very important that we get our heads across the legislation that's proposed and understand what it does do, but importantly, what it doesn't do. So thank you all.